If you haven't seen part one of this video, I suggest clicking here, otherwise you will be rather confused. In part one, I discussed the effects that access to the Dutch Railway would have for the Central Powers. This would allow quick movement past the Belgian defenses and allow a swift capture of Paris before the end of the year. After France and Britain are out of the war, Russia will be defeated and look for peace. I was briefly able to cover some ramifications of the scenario, but due to time, I wasn't able to go into much detail. This episode will be used to go into greater depth and wrap everything up. The ramifications will be more focused on the immediate aftermath of the Central Powers' victory, though, instead of the world at large. In our timeline, the war destroys the German monarchy, but in this timeline, the German Kaiser remains a predominant figure throughout the 20th century. His power would start to weaken over time as more democratic or socialist forces in Germany gained power, and it would be likely that the monarchy would eventually turn to little more than a simple figurehead. The German Chancellor Theobald Halvig had drafted the September Program in 1914 that stated German war goals and, and aimed peace terms for the ongoing conflict. These terms inc included annexing Luxembourg into the German Empire, annexing or creating a vassal state out of Belgium, with them ceding the eastern end of their nation up to Antwerp, for France, they wanted a strip of land connecting Germany or Belgium to Dunkirk on the English Channel, as well as 10 million marks in reparations and destruction of fortifications. Having this be the final peace treaty, I find to be rather dubious. The German government never approved this list as being stated as the war goals, so much more reasonable peace terms would like to be proposed. The small nation of Luxembourg may very well be annexed into Germany proper, as well as some adjustments along the French border though, primarily in the area of Lombrier or the whole Lorraine province. This region was rich in coal, limestone, and iron, and produced close to 80% of France's pre-war iron ore, and contained a large amount of varied resources within a rather compact area, which was something, something that was very heavily sought after. With this land, Germany would not only cripple France's iron production, but also produce nearly half of all iron ore in Europe. Many may look at the Treaty of brest as what German territorial ambitions would be in the East. However, this thought is almost certainly incorrect. When the treaty was presented, the Central Powers were on the brink of starvation, exhaustion, and bankruptcy, and wanted to make sure that Russia could not be a threat to them in the near future. The land taken was not only to cripple Russian population and industry, but also to get grain, meat, and other food products to prevent starvation both at home and on the front lines. The more realistic ambitions in the East will likely only consist of ceding Russian Poland and Lithuania to the Germans, as well as some economic concessions. The Austro-Hungarian Empire split apart into four separate nations towards the end of 1918. But even the Empire comes out of this alternate war relatively unscathed, it will be near collapse. It had been in decline for over a century, and ethnic tension was about to its breaking point. The main Austrian army had all, had all but been destroyed during the Russian counteroffensive into Galicia at the end of 1914, and various minorities, primarily Slavs, within the Austrian army actually joined the invading Russians. Others like the Czechs were reluctant to fight away from their cultural homeland, as they did not have equal rights throughout the empire. Land gains for the Austrians would be limited to putting Serbia as a client state under their control. If a Polish puppet state is created by the Germans, it is possible that the Polish strip of the empire would join that state. The death of Emperor Franz Joseph in 1916 removed one of the few factors that held the empire together. While the new emperor could attempt to improve the political conditions of the minority, he would be faced with constant backlash from the larger ethnic groups such as the Germans and Hungarians that didn't want to lose any political control within the empire. The Ottoman Empire would likely survive for a few decades after this war, as nationalism within the rest of the empire had mainly sparked during the late 19th century. And while many cultural slash nationalist groups were still active by World War I, many demanded autonomy rather than outright independence. The Arab revolt that occurred in our timeline wouldn't occur, as it got a large amount of funding from the British and French as well as some military support. It is possible to have them still fund these nomads for their own interests in the area, primarily the British, but they simply don't have the military and might to achieve our timeline success. You have to remember, the Ottomans were fighting on five fronts for a long period of the war. How long would the Empire last after this? Who knows? They could survive until modern day and beyond, or more likely be destroyed as time went on in this alternate timeline. How would Russia and France be after this war? 
It's a bit difficult to predict. The Russian Revolution that occurred in our timeline likely wouldn't happen. However, a revolution of some kind is almost certain to happen. A defeat would shatter what mass confidence people had for the Tsar's government, and a revolution had already occurred in 1905. As to whether or not this revolution would mirror that of the 1905 one is uncertain. It may very well be a repeat, with the Tsar quoting, quote, giving more power to a national assembly, one which he never used. Or he may well be overthrown, it's impossible to know. The dominant forces behind the revolution would not be communist in nature though. The Petrograd Soviet and communist forces in general didn't have much power until over one year later. In this scenario, they would likely just side with left slash socialist factions. France may very well experience a revolution of her own, but we simply don't know for certain. A large amount of the far right had been opposed to the war at the start, while many of the far left socialists and proto-fascists had supported the government's decision for a war. While this might cause support for the United Left to fall, it's uncertain if this would if it would cause the Raymond government to fall. If a revolution does occur, the communists wouldn't even be a factor, unlike in popular lore. The French Communist Party wasn't even established until the split of the Popular Front in 1920, following the Communist International founded by Lenin in 1919. I don't want to ramble on too long this episode, as it was merely meant to finish off the scenario. Changing an event as major as World War I would have endless bounds of changes to the world that we know. Going into detail about these changes would take far more time than I'm able to put in, and would be based on little more than speculation. What do you think would have happened if the Central Powers had won World War I? Say so in the comments below, don't forget to like and subscribe, and I will catch you guys next time.